I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to celebrate the publication of my father, Dr. M. Veerappa Moeli's book, The Flaming Dresses of Drowning. I would like to welcome the Honorable President of India, Shri Pranab Mukherjee, and thank him for gracing us with his presence today. I would also like to welcome Dr. Manmohan Singh, former Prime Minister of India, and Sri Vivek Dev Roy, the guest of honor for this evening, who is an economist, author, and member of Niti Aayog. My father's inquiry into Hindu mythology stems from the magic in his father's storytelling and the splendor of Yakshagana. The female characters in his books take center stage because of the presence of empowered women in his life. Thank you and welcome. A very good evening to the Honorable President of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee ji, former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Kharge ji, our author, Dr. Moili, Dr. Debroy, <coughs> various members of parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. For us as publishers, this is a special moment, as well as an awkward one. Special simply because a launch of a new book is a special moment in, in the journey of any publisher. A launch of a book like this is an even more special moment in the journey of any publisher, and more so, the launch of a book on an occasion like this by the first citizen of the country will always be the most special moment in the life of any publisher. So for my first of all, my many thanks to the Honorable President for consenting and agreeing to release this book. It is a unique situation that I personally find myself in. It is rare that a publisher is, is, has two authors on either side of the spectrum. On one side, Dr. Moily, and the other side, the Honorable President being the author himself. It has been a privilege, ladies and gentlemen, for us to have had the opportunity to work with both of these stalwarts. Uh, as publishers, we are supposed to be talking about the book and telling you a little bit about the, the narrative, etc. I would like to deviate from that a bit. Rather than the formal publisher's address where we tell, we tell you very, you know, we talk very highly about the book, I would like to give you two very interesting insights into the two, two people of today evening. And pardon me, uh, Vivek, I'm sure you will understand. The first is the f President of India. It's a privilege for us to have had the opportunity to publish him. We pu we've had the privilege to publish the first two volumes of his autobiography, and we're hoping to publish the third one in due course. But the lesser known fact about the President, ladies and gentlemen, is, men is that when as, as a young Indian, as a young publisher, I went and approached him, in my first few meetings, when I was interacting, I asked him, sir, you're giving me some data points. Do you want me to check? His answer was, no need. I've told you it will be correct. And ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you now, after three years of interaction, it is always, each and every time, every data point, every by-election, every percentage point was always correct. And it has been a privilege to interact with somebody with such large knowledge, such wide knowledge, and such deep knowledge of the Indian political system, and every time, um, I come up the Raisna Hill as a publisher to interact with the first citizen of India, I do set up a small prayer thanking the Almighty. So thank you, sir, for giving us that opportunity. Dr. Moily and I, we share a fascinating journey. I have never ceased to be amazed about Dr. Moily's energy. I, I do not understand where he draws it from. I have been told he gets up at 4 a.m. to write the book. It is, un, it is not unusual for somebody with such high discipline to be able to do so. But every time I get a call and my phone is flashing that it is from Dr. Moily's residence, there is something that happens. There's a flutter in my heart which says there's a new book coming. And always it is something that he's been working on. I think to be able to produce a book, to be able to get it translated, to be able to be diligent about it, and to be able to be disciplined about it is, is not an easy task, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I think Dr. Moily has produced books one after the other um, with such discipline that one can only be amazed about the depth and the discipline of the gentleman. Uh, so with, with, I thank you, sir, for having chosen us as a publisher and for having given us this opportunity. Um, we have been associated with the Moily household, where we've had the privilege of publishing Mrs. Moily as well as Hamsa. Um, it, was, it would probably be appropriate for me to also mention at this moment that I was the, if there is a term called the naughty in chief to 
nudge my uh, to nudge dear Hamsa to be a part of today's function because I thought it wouldn't be complete if the daughter wouldn't be able to give the welcome address. Uh, with these words, I once again thank the Honourable President and Dr. Moyley and all of you ladies and gentlemen for being here. Today is a special occasion. Thank you once again. Good evening to all of you. Honourable President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee. Dr. Manmohan Singh, Sri Malik Arjuna Karge, Sri Bibek Debroy, distinguished members of the parliament, distinguished scholars, friends, my dear friend, Sri Kapish Mehra, the managing director of Rupa and Company, friends. I have a pleasure today to present my epic poem, rather autobiography of Draupadi. It may sound very strange to you, but it is autobiography, soliloquy of Draupadi, the flaming tresses of Draupadi. Today, script, scriptures sometimes have a bad name. Militants and terrorists also use scriptures to support their cause and also ideology. Science has evaluated so many teachings of all scriptures. It has now become important to be clear what it is and what it is not. Every epoch or yuga depicts creative destruction or a great disruption. In Dwapara Yuga, Draupadi was a great disruptor. The French philosopher René Descartes mentioned that there was no need for revealing scriptures since reason provided us with ample information of God. British mathematician Isaac Newton scarcely mentioned the Bible to his, in his copious writings because he desired his knowledge of God from the intensive study of the university. Hence, science would soon clear up some of, the some of the irrational mysteries of traditional faith. My intensive study of each scripture ultimately leads to me more reason and more reason and espousing the truth and truth alone. As a result of my intense thoughts of for decades, Draupadi appears to be as a character serving all the experiences of Dwapara Yuga consolidated and condensed through the Solilo case. Even when she underwent oppression and exploitation, she did not shrink with fear or diffidence. Nor did he, does she blame the providence for that. Not only did she submit herself for a greater cause, but was also a powerful influence over the contemporaries and her exemplary character for the age she lived in and age that followed it. Only character which grew to match the towering personality of Krishna was that of Draupadi. She had the audacity to even to question Krishna. There was a blend of boldness and softness of human character within her. O Mother Yogeshwari, O oh, you the con configuration of vital fire, Agni, from time beginning, from time premier, you have within yourself kept all life alive and, and at the end of the dissolution of the world, you again make room for life in your womb. You are the mother of the university, bright as millions of sons born at once in the firmament. Draupadi says, Disrobing me was an event which shamed the world. It was transgression terrible of humanity and justice, and it resulted in throwing up the incandescent balls of fire full of hatred and anger. 
Parvati once told Shiva, when all the great rivers which are personified as women in Indian culture consult Ganga, Ganga told that women always follow men, women and not men. Hence, women can be compared to only another woman. Ganga said, a woman is the most powerful person. She is like a river with a propelling force behind the world. All the activities of the world would have come to a standstill but for her. For, for constructing something new, it is inevitable that the old should be demolished. We call it creative destruction. This is the meaning of every epoch or age or yuga. It's a fact that 21 civilizations of the world got erased because of crisis in character. Dwapara Yuga did not end because of Kurukshetra war, as we you know, seem to understand. But the fall was caused by the social evil, such as exploitation of women, atrocities, excess pleasure seeking, and oppression of the weak. You become the harbinger of a world free of exploitation and violence. You created a world full of confidence and self-respect. Somewhere Draupadi says, born in fire, I shall throw out the pathway of fire, move forward, and whatever, whatever rocks of obstruction come in my road, I shall have them all blasted to pieces. It matters not even if my blood is spilled or the body burnt. Who can, who can definitely, you know, you know, stop our thinking and thinking mind? These are the few, these are the few, you know, instances which I would like to quote. And this is written as if I am Draupadi. It was narrated at a soliloquy. That is the autobi autobiographical form. And this is the epic poem, The Flaming Tresses of Draupadi. Thank you very much. Honorable President of India, Shri Pranab Mukherjee, respected Dr. Moili, the explicitly acknowledged inspiration behind the book, Mrs. Moili, respected Dr. Manmohan Singh, distinguished invitees. I can think of only one reason why I have been asked to say a few words here, and that is the kindness of Dr. Moili and Kapish Mehra. Several years ago, there was a similar launch at which Dr. Moili's book, known as Ramayan Maha Anveshanam, was released. At that time, I had asked him what next, and he had said Draupadi. So I had known that he was working on a book on Draupadi. The trouble with reading a book like this, at least for a person like me, is that I don't know Kanara. And this is poetry. It is very, very difficult to translate poetry into any other language unless you are a poet yourself. And Dr. Moily, let me say that the translation of this into English is far, far superior to that of Ramayan Mahanveshanam. So I'd like to congratulate not only Dr. Moili, but also the translator who's present here. It's a beautifully crafted book. Hangsa Moili already mentioned Dr. Moili's preference for female characters. Actually, it's a little bit more than that. And let me give you just one example of that. All of us are familiar with the city of Hastinapur. Named Hastinapur either because there were many elephants there or alternatively because it was named after a king named Hasti. Unless it figures in Kannada literature, 
I have never come across Hastinapur being referred to as Hastinavati. And there are several such neat flourishes and touches. To state the obvious, there are very powerful female characters in the Mahabharata. Unlike the Sita of the Valmiki Ramayana, they are not Chai Vanu Gata Sada. They do not follow like shadows. Draupadi, Satyavati, even Shakuntala, because the Shakuntala of the Mahabharata is a far, far more powerful character than the Shakuntala of Kalidasa's Avigyan Shakuntala. So what's new? Draupadi has been written about. Many people have reinterpreted the Mahabharata, perhaps not always in poetry, from Draupadi's lens. In Bengali, Dr. Moili Dei was a play, very powerful play, called Nath Bati Anath Bat by Shauli Mitra. The Palace of Illusions, all of these have looked at it from Draupadi's angle. And there are many angles to Draupadi, which is why this is called the flaming tresses of Draupadi. The obvious reference being to Draupadi having taken a vow not to braid her hair until it had been washed with Dushashana's blood. But there's probably a little bit more to that metaphor than that because by the time it came to classical Sanskrit literature, women did not braid their hair and left it loose not only when they were widows but also when their husbands were not present. So in a sense, there is a metaphor there, not just in terms of Dushashan's blood, but Draupadi after Savha Parva, after the incident in the assembly hall of her husband's being there, but not being there until the Kurukshetra war was over. Draupadi had special relationships with several people. One was Krishna. There was Karna. And there was Bhima also, because if you think of, of the incidents in the Mahabharata, every time Draupadi was in trouble or wanted something, she either asked Krishna or asked Bhima. So even if it is a flower to be fetched, even if it is Kichak to be killed, she has never asked Arjuna. She has always asked either Krishna or what, however, is very unusual about this book, but before that, Draupadi has two female companions in this book. And these two female companions are named Nitamvani and Maya, or Maya, as Dr. Moyle says. I cannot recollect a single instance where Draupadi is depicted as having two female companions, which is much more reminiscent, and I will come back to this in a minute, which is much more reminiscent of Radha and Krishna than Draupadi and the Mahabharata. I was immediately reminded of a certain shloka in Gita Govindam, Nitamvini. It goes like this, Rati Sukhasare, Gatam Abhisare, Madana Manohara Vesham, Nakuru Nitam Vinigamana Vilambana, Anusara Tangrida Esham. That's not important. What is important is, there is a very interesting assimilation of the Vaishnava literature and the Radha Krishna kind of relationship into this retelling of the story from Draupadi's point of view. I have not come across this anywhere. Where does Draupadi's story end? With Dr. Moili, it ends when the war is over. But Draupadi's story does not end there. There is a further event of her sons being killed. There is a further event of her dying on that last journey. And I wonder what Draupadi would have felt or what Draupadi would have been made to feel had Dr. Moili probed those also. Thank you, Dr. Moili, for having given me the opportunity of being one of the privileged few to have read one of the first copies of this book. Thank you.
गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर मनमोहन सिंह डॉक्टर बीरापा मैली श्री मल्लिकार्जुन खारगे कोपीश मेहड़ा डिस्टिंग्विस्ड गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू I am glad to have this opportunity of welcoming this very distinguished gathering to Rashtrakuti Bhavan on the occasion of the presentation of the first copy of my list, Draupadi in Flames, Traces of Flames, translated in English. The original was written in Canada, and the English version has been presented to me. I know Dr. Moyli for more than five decades, the early 70s onwards. We not only know each other, but we have worked very closely on many occasions, whether in the union government under Dr. Manmohan Singh or when he was the chairman of Administrative Reforms Committee and I, as chairman of the group of ministers, had the advantage of looking through those reports and having interaction with him at the political plenum when I was in charge of Karnatok from Indian National Congress in the late 70s, on all these occasions, I had the opportunity of working with him in different capacities. And I always appreciated his administrative skill, political equipment, and total commitment to his duties and responsibilities. But at the same time, when I later discovered that he is an author, and not just like many casual authors like me, but a serious one, who makes writing in a professional way almost every day at a particular point of time with the objective of writing. Amongst the political activists and busy, personal, pub, <coughs> busy public personalities, we do not find such quality very often. The subjects on which he has written, of course, are perhaps the most emotive issues till today to Indian minds. These two great epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata, have tremendous influence on Indian mind in different ages, different forms. And political leaders also commented, starting from Tilok to Rajaji, even Mahatma Gandhi, had written and commented very exhaustively on the different aspects of these two epics. In short, it has profoundly influenced Indian mind, thought process, and even the daily practices. I am grateful to Dr. Moili for picking up the character of Draupadi from Mahabharata and having a perspective of the whole epic through her eyes. Draupadi as a character have always drawn the admirative admiration 
from every reader. Simply perhaps it is difficult to ignore her when you read Mahabharata. Like any other epic, normally the epics are crowded with events, incidents, personalities, actions, reactions. So there is no dearth of personalities, interesting actions, reactions. But the central theme of these two epics are two women who have profound influence on Indian psyche. Perhaps keeping that in mind, the creator, Vedab Vaish, thought it would be appropriate that Draupadi must burn out of flames, not out of wombs. And there is a sharp contrast. Sita comes out of earth. Draupadi comes out of fire. And whole action, whole life, she burns like flame and ignites almost everyone. Though I have received the copy a little earlier, in fact, I'm grateful to my friend Mr. Moili for presenting me the first copy and then another copy yesterday while formally giving me the invitation. I have glanced through a few pages. But what I find, what strikes me, as Vivek very correctly pointed out, the various aspects, he himself presented in a very lucid manner. The translator has caught the real flame of the character and I am confident that every reader will find it not only interesting, but it will captive the attention and perhaps, if time permits, nobody will be able to leave the book unless it is finished. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Jai. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Rupa Publications, I would like to express our gratitude and thanks to the Honorable President Sri Pranav Mukherjee for gracing us with his august presence. We're extremely thankful to our esteemed guest of honor, Sri Bibek Devra, and humbled by your presence. We'd also like to thank Dr. Virappa Moili for giving us the honor to publish his book. We thank everyone at the President's Secretariat for their immense support and cooperation. We are also indebted to our honorable guests for lending your support to the book and making this event a success. Thank you again.